Welcome to the Nebula Music Podcast, an interview series where I talk to some of today's most influential musicians, bands, artists, entrepreneurs, and basically anyone who's killing it in the music industry. Today, I'm excited to be speaking with the one, the only, J.P. Bouvet. For those of you guys that are not drummers and are tuning in to this podcast, J.P. Bouvet is a very well-known drummer who's very young. I believe he's actually my age, but he made a splash in the drumming scene back in 2011, I believe, where he won the Guitar Center Drum Off. And he made a huge splash because he, he was a very talented drummer. He approached the drum off and the solo with a with finesse essentially he approached it with this just amazing skill that hadn't been seen in a while and he used that to propel his career to new heights and, and he's essentially made a name for himself as a very talented drummer a drummer that knows what he's doing as a very good educator he's basically become a huge influence in the drumming community Now, at the end of the episode, if you enjoy the interview, please consider subscribing because I do this every week. I bring on great musicians, basically anyone who's killing it in the music industry. I bring them on the show, talk about their process, how they got started, and basically what keeps them motivated. And my hope is that these interviews inspire you to keep pushing your career forward always. But let's not waste any more time. Let's dive right in. All right, what's up, everybody? Eddie Barco here again, and I'm very excited because I've been trying... Well, actually, I've been dreaming of having this person on my show for a very long time. And for all of you drummers out there, which I'm assuming it's a big part of you because I'm a drummer, a lot of drummers follow what I do, um, you guys will definitely know the guests that I have on the show. I have Mr. J.P. Bouvet on the show. J.P., how are you, man? I'm fantastic and better now, thanks to my good company. Oh, I, oh man, that makes me feel so special, man. Look at that. Look at that. Already starting the conversation off in a really good way. Um, JP, I mean, there's, there's so many great things that I could say about you. And for those of you guys that are listening that may not be drummers or may not be aware of what JP's done, I mean, honestly, dude, we're probably going to get to it, but you've done so much in so little amount of time. I mean, you're very young. You're probably younger than me. Um, and you're just, you've become a drum phenomenon in just the past couple of like, I don't know, seven, eight years, ever since I saw your Guitar Center drum off. So guys, this guy is a phenomenal drummer who's just doing it all. But rather than me, you know, talking about you, JP, I would much rather it be you talking about yourself. So why don't we go ahead and just start off by talking a little bit about you, man. Maybe tell me a little bit about your backstory, how you guys started playing drums and uh, maybe what you're up to now, and then we'll just sort of go from there. All right, cool. I'll give you the the super abbreviated timeline. Tell me whichever timeline you want. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah, well, we, I'll, I'll give you the, the the menu, and we can kind of dig in wherever you want. So, <laughs> I like that. So, yeah, I was born in Minnesota in the suburbs of Minneapolis in Lakeville, Minnesota. I'm actually here right now visiting my parents for the week. So this has worked out great because I have ample time on my hands. So I was born here, started playing drums when I was nine. My mother is a wonderful musician, plays the electric bass and various other types of things, beautiful singer and everything. Nice. So music was kind of in the house. It wasn't pushed on me by any means, but I don't really know why, but I started hitting chop or hitting Tupperware and pots and pans with chopsticks. And As uh, we all do, man. I feel like all drummers have the exact same starting point. You know what I, I mean? Know. We really have the Chinese to thank for half of drummers' beginnings. (laughs) (laughs) Without that that tiny pair of child-sized drumsticks in every person's silverware drawer, who knows how many of us would never have started. So true. So true. (laughs) Uh, See, I I ended up taking lessons from this guy, Wade Linkert, for seven years. He was fantastic. I feel like I owe a lot of my varied love for music and my, my the way I've you know I developed drumming and the way that I practice and all that stuff to him and you know whether he knew it or not he was he was brilliant and then uh yeah high school started doing like high school jazz band when I was 13 I started my well I I joined I auditioned for and joined a band we became a prog rock trio with a guy named Mike Linden who you might have heard his album many years later in in college called uh Bubble and Squeak and that was like the first one of the earliest albums I ever played on. And it was really cool kind of fusion stuff. Oh, um, wow. Nice. And then I ended up, you know, long, <laughs> jump to the end of the story and then we'll come back. <laughs> he now lives, he's, he's my oldest friend. He lives next door to me. 
and I'm the godfather of his for his daughter, and we have done many, many things together. He's also a programmer that designed my website. So my he was my first musical contact and is basically my the closest thing I have to a brother now. So it's kind of a beautiful story in itself. But that's uh, gotta be the coolest thing to have. Like basically some the the person that you played on their first album essentially end up being your next door neighbor for a very long time. I mean that's that's a dream come true, man. Yeah, and I actually have him to thank for me being involved in the music industry at all. And it really was just because him, he started this band. He was very driven back in the day when we were 13. And he, like, that was my outlet. That was the reason I took music music seriously. So in, in a sort of accidental and indirect way, he is a huge part of my life. Um, but yeah, so... That was all great. Playing, started getting into fusion. You know, I started listening back in the day. I was really into like Travis Barker, Mike Portnoy. Started getting into like Chick Corea electric band, Dave Weckl nice. in high school. Go through all that. Played in a lot of big bands in Minnesota when I was still living here, finishing up high school. And just as I was starting to really get my foot in the big band scene, they were starting to give me calls to sub for the shittiest gigs that they offer. <laughs> <laughs> but I was totally happy to do them because I was just stoked to be, you know, playing. Um, then I went to Berkeley College of Music. I did two and a half years there studying the professional music degree, which means that it was a mix and match major because I was very ready to be a jack of all trades. And Wait, what is that? I don't mean to interrupt, but what does that mean, mix and match major? Specifically? You, can, you can take classes from other majors. Any oh, major. got it. Nice. There aren't, there aren't really many, if any, um, professional music classes so hmm. i was taking arranging classes uh writing classes playing classes all sorts of stuff business classes um but i did two and a half years dropped out to focus more on the drum off and uh, by a stroke of amazing good luck won the drum off in 2011 and then yeah since then launched a website where i have 350 video lessons currently nice. um do lots of educational stuff around the world and play in a band and have played in many bands and play for Generation X and all that. And here I am. Wow, man. Nice, concise little summary. You make it seem so just, you know, very much like, ah, you know, this happened, but you guys have no idea why I'm geeking out so much because, I mean, you mentioned Guitar Center. And by the way, there's a lot of things that you mentioned in your story that I want to circle back to once we get an opportunity. But I think um, a lot of the people, especially drummers, you know, we are known for loving uh, you know, to watch other drummers. Like, I feel like in our spare time, we tend to watch a lot of other drummers just play because that's how we learn. Um, and I definitely first got introduced to you through the Guitar Center drum off back in 2011, I want to say, I think it was. Yep. Yeah, which is almost 10 years ago, man, when you really think about it. That's insane. Um, <laughs> I'm getting old. <laughs> but um, the reality is it's I got introduced to you when I first watched the Guitar Center drama. And, and right off the back, I recognized just how skillful you were and just everything that you were playing just, you know, to me, seemed so professional, just so way out of this world, like even things that I couldn't think about. And so you just mentioned that you essentially dropped out of school to – basically practice for that. And I'm sure maybe there were other reasons, but that was probably one of the major goals on your mind. How did you decide to do that and why, if I can ask? Yeah, so you're correct in that it wasn't the only reason. Um, and so the slightly longer version of that story is I had done the drum off probably five times previously since oh, I was 15 on and off. And no, I don't think anyone's ever won it on their first go, at least not the last 10 years that they did it. Yeah, I don't uh, think so. I, You know what? I think... Uh, I think it's Eric Moore might have won it on his first shot, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised there. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people need to, need to learn the ropes of yeah. how to practice building a solo and all that stuff. So, yeah, I've done it a bunch of times. This And funny enough, the year before that, I was like late to the first round because Guitar Center was just further than I thought it was. And I was living in Boston and I was walking there. And some friend was late, so I was waiting for them and blah, blah, blah. And they actually disqualified me. So the year before, I didn't participate at all. Wow. And then that year, I had kind of half prepared. But again, it was in Boston, tons of bands and school and stuff. So I, I didn't have a whole lot of extra time. So I got there and I got to the first round. And the thing about Boston is since it's Bright by Berkeley, the Boston, like the first round in Boston is like one of the toughest rounds Oh, yeah. I, it has to be. <laughs> you just have 
and, and it's it's actually it's kind of crazy because there's no the limit on how many people do the first round is like twelve. It's like a high number of people doing it. So it's actually it's it's kind of more difficult because you'll have a huge number of really good players come and do some crazy stuff. So yeah, but somehow. Uh, I ended up winning that first round, I think because mainly I had sort of constructed a more thoughtful composition. Um, I Is that w- not normally I- the case at a Guitar Center Drums? And, and I've seen plenty of them, you know, but I, I think I've seen a lot of like, the championship versions at the end where they actually film it at a theater. Um, is that normally the case? Like people just, just show up and just kind of play for five minutes? They don't really construct something? Well, it's, I mean, that's one thing that bites people in the butt a lot, where they kind of half prepare, and then their nerves get the better of them, and they fall apart. Um, but, yeah, I, I, the, I don't know. Honestly, I just knew if I tried to wing it, it would suck. So that, <laughs> that's really the reason that I planned. And most people find the same thing. In their mind, they're in the practice room slaying it, and they're like, dude, if I just do this, I'm sick. And then you know, they forget that like your nerves make you suck at everything. So well, that's where a lot of people kind of fall short. But um, yeah, so anyways, I don't know why I got through that first round, but I was walking back after the first round, and I remember a very specific moment <clears throat> where I was, I, I had been studying some really cool things that I thought were unique to the drum off that I hadn't seen in the drum off, particularly that 516 time signature in the beginning, which isn't really 516, it's like quintuplets, one, two, three, four, five, ba, da, 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 one, two, three, four, five, ba, yeah. and the seven, eight, clave, one, two, three, four, six, one, two, three, da, 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 boom, like that. Um, did I just do that in seven? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to trust you on that. <laughs> those things I thought were really unique. So I was walking back and I kind of had this realization, it was kind of a moment for me where I was like, I think I have the... Like, it's possible for me to win, right? I don't know if I deserve it. I don't think anyone deserves it. But I think I've got some cool ideas, and I think I have the technical capabilities for it to be in the realm of possibility. And that kind of lit a fire under my butt that was pretty serious. So from there forth, I decided I was going to practice four hours a day for the drum off. Well, no, not necessarily for the drum off. Four hours a day, um, regardless of what was going on. And I, pre- I stuck to that pretty hard. So, um, I mean, that, like, uh, and I don't mean to interrupt again, but I'm curious. Like, when you said that you felt that like fire ignite of you, uh, ignite inside of you, um, you know, different people that come through the show and just other people that I get a chance to speak to, they all describe very similar moments. Um, but it, it's always it's obviously very different from person to person. Was your like you know that initial um, or that that moment when you realized, hey, I can do this? Was it immediate? Was it like the minute you were walking on the street and you just felt this gut feeling like you know what? This is exactly what I'm gonna do a couple of hours a day or did it take a couple of days maybe a couple of weeks for it to sort of solidify into that passion that you were describing no it was a it was a realization but it required some thinking like some active thinking so i was walking home alone after that actually and yeah i was, I was just like really putting some thought into the whole thing and i realized that if i cared about it it would i would do much better so i kind of invested myself in it and that that really changed my outlook and my actions toward it so yeah so i started practicing really hard um skipping you know other stuff and what was cool and this is this is actually like an important side lesson for anyone is that i was the reason it was so easy to practice for the drum off and the reason i'm not really saying i was practicing necessarily for the drum off is that in the drum off, I was trying to just do like the you know coolest stuff that I could, which doesn't mean yeah. practice for the drum off. It just means become a better drummer. So I had these new ideas that I was introduced to or found myself, and I was just trying to get better at the drums. And I was constantly aware of like what I could use in a solo, and then you know as the next round would come around, I would start to construct it more consciously, and. Yeah, just kind of going forth like that. And I try to I try to keep that in mind whenever I'm preparing for something is like if you think of it like I need to prepare for this thing, it becomes very one dimensional and your what you play and practice becomes one dimensional and oftentimes becomes less fun because you're just thinking about the songs I need to learn or yeah. whatever it might be. So 
I like to, and sometimes you got to learn some songs and that's fine. But at the same time, if you just kind of open your mind up and think, okay, I'm like, what am I getting better at as a drummer in doing this? And you might, that might inspire some different, you know, exercises you create, some different ways of thinking about it. Um, and it might make it just easier for you to practice if you're keeping in mind like, oh, this isn't just for the gig. I mean, the gig could get canceled, right? It doesn't yeah. really matter at the end of the day. It's like, this is just for me. So that, that makes a bit of a difference for me. Um, so that's what made it kind of easy to practice. And yeah, so I was practicing a lot, been in a lot of bands and whatnot, and I had kind of put off my midterms and there were a lot of arranging midterms. And then the finals started to approach and uh, I was like, wow, this is going to take a lot of time. And at that point, I was to the finals. So I was like, okay, like I could spend 100 hours writing horn charts or 100 hours practicing. So that's the one reason that I did drop out was the drum off. The other one was since given the nature of that degree that I described I was doing it, I was trying to fill my next semester and I just wasn't that excited about a lot of the classes hmm. because it gets to the point after two years where you start really specializing. And again, I didn't have that much of an interest or to be honest, a gift in any specialization, whether it be production or film scoring or anything like that. So those two things combined uh, were the two reasons that I ended up dropping out. And it was a little hard convincing my parents, um, <laughs> who, had, who had graciously paid for school, um, but who understood for the most part that the degree would mean nothing in the field I was going into. So uh, they were totally cool about it. My, my dad kept being like, my dad's more of a traditional fellow. He was like, but you can always go back. You know, I was like, <laughs> well, yeah, but I'm, I'm not going to go back. And he was like, but you could. And I'm like, sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's how it all worked out. And then I, I went home to this house I'm in right now in Minnesota, um, to my parents' house, and just practiced like every day a ton for a month leading up to it. And that was that. Wow. I mean, I love hearing the story of just how you, you essentially decided to do that. And, and the reason why I, I hone in on that a lot, because... Every single success story that I hear or that, you know, someone talks to me about whatever decision they made, you know, usually always starts at a point that you described, which is, you know, I decided or I figured out that, you know, this was the right choice for me and what I was currently doing wasn't the right choice um, and I needed to take action and move away from it. So I imagine, for example, you know, Berkeley is a very good accomplishment, a huge accomplishment for any kind of musician at that young age to be able to get into Berkeley alone is a huge accomplishment, right? Um, and you had to have the, I guess I could say, I could describe it as the courage and the clear mindset to be able to say, hey, um, even if I come back next year and I look at this semester and it just doesn't make me any, it doesn't make me happy. I don't feel joy um, filling out this semester. I really need to focus on myself. Do you feel like that sort of courage, did you always have that? Did you sort of learn it? Did you figure out that specific moment? And the reason why I ask is because I get asked this a lot by random people that watch my videos or whatever. They're pretty much just like, hey, when do you like decide that this is like what you got to do? Like, how do you know? Because there's just so many other things that, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so I'm always curious and fascinated by how it is that you came to that decision because it does take courage. It does take courage to leave arguably the best music school in the country to, you know, go practice for yourself. You know what I mean? It was the right choice. But at the moment, I imagine, obviously, you didn't know the future. So I'm curious, like, do you feel like you've always had that? Did you learn it? Um, did you learn it from someone else? Or, or like, how did that decision come to be? And, and do you feel like you were prepared for that or just sort of happened, if that right. makes sense? I think there's a couple of things that are the most important. And one of them is um, the ability to, I mean, this isn't, this is, well, first of all, I almost want to, like, uh, discredit what sounds like it's extraordinary and put it in pretty ordinary terms. I, mean, I am a fairly ordinary guy. Um, <laughs> Who can shred on the drums. <laughs> so, so the things that led to that decision in my mind, one is thinking critically. So just, you know, being able to take stock of what you've got and take a step back and see what you're dealing with and and be realistic about it. Um, and the other thing is, is really to, to work hard and do what you can 
given your opportunity, right? So yeah, and this is something I've I've been thinking about a lot lately, and I never thought about it at the time, um, but I think one of the things that has helped me and people that I see succeeding a lot is, like I said, just that sort of self analysis and critical thinking, um, because going through you know just going through the motions um, is usually not a good idea <laughs> in <laughs> a field where you literally have to stand out, right? So yeah. Berkeley is a weird place, especially now, because it's even more expensive than when I went. So I get a lot I of I mean, that. all schools are. All schools are getting more expensive. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, Berkeley is one of the most expensive in the world, and no one seems to care that there's zero job placement afterwards. Damn. Like how can, can I ask like how expensive was it when you went to school? I don't mean to interrupt. I'm just four thousand dollars when I went and I, I haven't checked recently, but I think it's in the sixties now. Jesus. Per year. That's a so, yearly salary, man. Damn. So I get this question a lot as well, um, of like, I wanna do this, you know, for a living and you know, maybe do I need to go to Berkeley, do I need to do this? And there is no simple answer. And there's no blanket answer because there are a thousand factors that could be different from person to person. Hmm. Um, but it's it's not like like even if you try to do exactly what I did, it won't work, right? Because a the drum off doesn't exist. B you're not me. C the same people that I've worked with weren't there, so you wouldn't. You know, it's it's like everything is different. Yeah. So yeah, I I boil it down to really like taking a step back, looking at what you can do, and then putting your head down and working really hard. Um, for me, like that, when you say that courage was like, it, it was just the logical thing to do, actually. Yeah. You know, like had I lost the drum off, it still would have been the logical thing to do. It would just, would seem less heroic in retrospect. Right. <laughs> so I think you got to, Go for it. You got to shoot for the stars, but you can't put all your chips on landing on the moon. You know what I mean? So right. what I mean is, and this is, again, this is like when I, when I hear people like, I got to go to Berkeley if I want to have a career in music, I'm like, hold the phone. Most musicians that exist in the world did not go to Berkeley, right? So clearly yeah. that's true. It was the same thing with the drum off. Like there's good in, the drum off is no more. So they're not doing it indefinitely which is good and bad. It, it's bad because it was an awesome opportunity for people to practice performing and writing solos, and it gave a lot of attention to the drum world. Um, it's good because some people had that lottery ticket mentality about the drum off, and they yeah. thought, if I win that, my career is made. And, and I would literally talk to people who were like, basically saying, as soon as I win the drum, like I'm everything I do with my drumming is so that I can compete better next year in the drum off because when I win it and they were literally just when I win it, then I'm set. And I was like, A, there's no way you can plan on winning it. There's 5,000 people entering this year and it takes an extraordinary amount of luck, just sheer luck. Yeah. And even to the finals, let alone win. So, no, bad plan. Like, don't put too many eggs in that basket, right? There's better things you can spend your time doing. Um, and the other thing is, like, how many, I mean, of the last 20 drum-offs, how many of the winners can you name? Like, I did the drum-off, and I can probably only name, like, eight. So it's not a sure ticket to fame. Otherwise, we'd know who they all were, right? Some people yeah. sort of faded into the distance. So, I mean, the lessons there are that you don't get one big break that makes your whole career happen. You get a series of big and small breaks, but the continuation of the breaks is what's important. So you got to put yourself in a place and develop a mentality where you can, you can keep encountering those opportunities, whatever they might be. Yeah. I love that, man. I love how you're explaining that. It just, uh, yeah, I got to admit to you, I'm going to be honest with you for a split second. When I was younger, when I was a teenager, that was totally me. 
That was a hundred percent me. The guy you you just yeah. described, who had a lot of high hopes of the of the um, the drum off, uh-huh. that was totally me. Like I I went through a moment where I practiced a lot for that competition, and I'm not ashamed to admit it because I feel like, well, I mean specifically for me, you know, when I I I, I didn't come from a very musically uh, trained family or environment where I pretty much was figuring figuring everything out on my own, um, and it's just it's interesting because that hopeful feeling of if I just did this, if I just achieved that then everything would be okay and and it's funny because there's no even guarantee that afterwards like you were saying that anything would happen afterwards but yet somehow it's so easy almost like you were saying like that lottery ticket mentality to hone in on it on one opportunity on one very vague opportunity obviously now we can't use the the drum the drum off anymore because it doesn't exist but insert whatever other random opportunity here um you can focus on that one thing and just train for that one exact thing Uh, and there's that big chance that it might not ever even happen you know what i mean and there's i'm realizing as you're talking about it it's like where you're placing the like the responsibility like for your future, right? Because if it's external, right? this Berkeley is the ultimate example, right? If you're someone who, who's, who places the, your own fate in external things, then you say, if I get into Berkeley, I'm good. So that person who's very like, um, perhaps not self-driven, but, but just needs to think, they think they need to be in the right place with the right people. Um, of course, there's some truth to that, but it also requires you doing some effort. Um, you could go through Berkeley and ace all your classes, and leave just happy as a clam, the valedictorian, with a nice uh, quarter million dollars of debt and have literally no idea of what to do with your life, which is amazing, right? So the yeah. opposite person would be the person that puts their fate, the responsibility of their fate fully on themselves and says, hey, even if I'm at Berkeley, it's on me to make this shit happen, right? Yeah. Even if I win the drum off, it's on me to make this into something, right? Yeah. Even if I move to the greatest music city in the world, I move to Nashville, Nashville's not going to give me a job. I have to build a job. So it's, in the art career, I mean, this is unique to what we do, but I think any of the art mediums, you you have to have that internal responsibility. Like you can't, you don't just get hired by the right company and work your way up the ladder, you know? Yeah. It doesn't work like that, especially, I mean, I feel like that's the same for almost anyone who's uh, technically a freelancer. I think I've talked about this many times with other successful musicians like yourself. Um, It's essentially treating your career like you are a freelancer. You know, no one's going to, there is no company to rise up the ladder. You know, there is no step-by-step process, uh, especially with music. Music is such a creative outlet um, that there's just no way that it can happen. And you know what? More often than not, here's one thing actually I find a lot, and I'm curious to see what you think. Um, I sometimes find other people, and this has happened to me too in the past too, um, where an opportunity arises, right? An opportunity arises. And maybe at the time, we don't see it for what it is, but we know it's an opportunity, but we're so set on doing one specific thing that's just really i'm not i don't want to say impossible but you know you know what i'm trying to say it's basically we're so set on let's say going to berkeley that maybe there's another chance of going to another school um that's maybe not as expensive but it's still you know pretty quality uh, good education right my question to you is when do you know, specifically for J.P. Bouvet, because I love how you were explaining everything, you know, life and success really is a combination of big breaks, small breaks, and sometimes even some losses. But the point is you, you move forward continuously. Mm-hmm. As J.P. Bouvet, how do you choose which big things to go after? Because it's so, like you said, you were, you focused on guitar center drum off, but I'm curious if your mindset was to win or if you were just doing it just to see if you could and then you just chose to go after it, if that makes sense. Right. So when do I when do I know to go after it? I mean, that yeah. was an extraordinary... And maybe, you know what, and it's a broad question, and I, I apologize if it's too broad, but I'm curious, like, what you think about that. Yeah, well, the, the actually, one reason I tend to avoid the drum off as an example is that it's so extraordinary, and there's so much luck involved. Yeah. Because I did go after it hoping to win it, but fully aware that I might not, right? But honestly, in the back of my head, I was like, I can't, I could win this shit. Even, even when they were about to announce the winner, I was like, it could be me. I mean, it could be other people, but it could be me. Um, so there was like, it was possible. But 
that's an extraordinary example. As far as other stuff, it's like what I kind of what I like to think is like how far can you reach given your situation, right? Yeah. So again, the self analysis, the critical thinking thing, that's your move. So you take a step back and you say, okay, I live in Lakeville, Minnesota. It's a random suburb. It's kind of close to Minneapolis. Um, and I'm 18 years old and I want to do something with my music. So you think, how far can I reach? Right? Well, shit. I mean, if, if Berkeley is a financial option, great, go for it. I think it's, or whatever school you want to go to, go for it. And in my mind, it was like Berkeley is the best music school. So I'm going to try and go there. And if I get enough scholarship, maybe I can go there. So that was my shoot for, shoot for the moon. But if I got no scholarship or had not gotten in, the answer wouldn't be like, well, I'm toast. I'm going to like, you know, it, what, <laughs> so it would be how far can I reach still, right? Given my situation. situation. Yeah. The situation then would probably be, well, is it, is it move to Minneapolis? Is it get closer to the city? Is it study at McNally Smith in Minneapolis? It's a music school. Is it go to MI, right? So, so given what's possible for me, what do I do? Because staying here is clearly not an option. And that's, it sounds overly simple, but it's hard to do that for people. Yeah. And it's hard to do that, especially when you're young. Like when you're 18, when I was 18, I wasn't good at thinking about stuff. But like the more you, you try to figure out your life, the more you, you experiment with this, the better you get at knowing where you can land realistically. Like right yeah. now in my life, I've done enough things and succeeded and failed at enough of my goals that you start to get and you develop an instinct for what you can and can't do, if that right. makes sense. And honestly, for me, the, the goals that I have now are more humble than they were when I was 20. When I was 20, I just was, I was going to be the best drummer in the entire world, the fastest, everything. I was just going to be the fucking cock of the walk in every <laughs> way possible. And it's funny because as I've evolved, like what I want now in my life is actually not anything like that. Like, I want to just feel good playing the drums. I want it to sound like something that I enjoy. I want it to be musical. And if people dig it, that's really cool. But I actually don't really care how much people dig it. Like to a certain extent, sure I do. And sure, everyone's ego gets fed off, you know, having some likes on a video. But my, my goal is, is like, I want to play music I actually care about. I want to be with people I care about. And yeah, it's just funny how it, you get good at knowing what you want and what you're capable of. But I'm actually, to be honest, I'm glad I didn't know back in the day. What I thought I was capable of, and maybe I was, was, you know, infinite. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like grown. And that's, I think it's called. It's part of being young. Yeah, it's the beautiful part of being young. I think it's called thinking smarter. Um, because I used to talk about this thing called doism, which was, you know, kind of, in a, you know, in summary, it was just like when you have an idea and you think it's freaking brilliant, you have to do it. Yeah. And have to, you have that feeling of like, this is the right thing. And sometimes you just know, and you have to at least start trying so that you can figure out if you're right or wrong. So it was that. And I used to talk about this phase of aggressive doing. So it was just take every opportunity that comes. You never know who you're going to meet. You never know what you're going to learn from it, what you're going to learn you don't like to do, what you're going to learn you do like to do. And that for me was Berkeley time yeah. where I, I did my first studio sessions. I played played and heard new genres that I had never listened to in my life from prog rock trios with Felix Martin on the 14 string guitar to Latin jazz ensemble to trying to get good at jazz and always sucking at it to all, <laughs> you know, my yeah, singer songwriter and pop studio sessions, all sorts of stuff that was new to me probably played in a dozen bands while I was there. Um, and I remember doing stuff and doing it for like a whole semester and like really getting into one thing, like, like all these sessions for singer songwriters and then being like, I don't think I dig this. Like I, I don't like how detached I am. Like then I'm the dispensable wheel in the machine. So you know, what's interesting is, is I was the complete opposite of that. It's, um, I came from like a more of a, ja a jazz background. And once I started experimenting with more singer songwriters, I actually really enjoyed it. Complete opposite. That's, and that's beautiful. Cause there's a, there's exactly, there's a place for everyone. Some people just want to exactly. show up 
play songs they know, go home, collect a paycheck, and have like a normal life. Some people want to be really creatively involved. And, it, you know, you, that's the whole point of this doism phase is you're trying to find out what it is you want to put your energy toward. So then I, I when I left Boston after Berkeley, I moved to New York a, a year before most of my friends. Since I had dropped out, I was early off the boat, and me and one friend moved to New York. And I just had, I didn't know anyone here. I had nothing going on. I was basically just taking buses back and forth to Boston to do things with my old bands and stuff. So yeah. then I kind of entered, and then the drum off happened, and then I started to build a following, and yada, yada, yada. And it turned more into, okay, I've got, I've done, you know, some things, and I'm starting to figure out, A, what I'm good at, B, what I like doing, and C, what I can do, given my resources. So then it's like you sort of you stop doing everything. So phase one would be like aggressive doing and phase two would be like do smarter. So this is again, it's like this is taking a step back and saying, let's make a plan. Let's not work harder. Let's work smarter, smarter. Yeah. And, and try to try to build something. Because when you're taking every opportunity, you might accidentally be building like the fact that you can be a great session guy and kind of answer any call. And that's exciting in its own way. And I have, you know, some months of my life, I feel like that's still where it's totally random stuff coming up. And I'm like, and I love it. But I don't think unless you want to be that guy, uh, that's the most useful, productive use of your time. I like to think of this imagery where you're in a vast body of water and you have kind of an internal compass and you, you look you're treading water and you look which way you want to go and you kind of take a second and you think, okay, that's the way I want to go toward that thing. And then you put your head down and you have to swim and you have to just swim for a while. But then every once in a while, every couple of weeks, maybe it's every couple of days, maybe it's every couple of months, you got to take a break, put your, put your head up, say, am I still going in the right direction? And is this still the direction I want to be going in? And if it feels like it might not be, have I gone far enough in that direction that I can feel positive that I don't want to go in that direction, right? Huh. Because Great picture, problem, man. Two problems people have is one is they just tread water forever and they think too much and they never act. We got great ideas all day. I'm going to do this and I'm going to start this band after I move to Baltimore. I'm going to do this. And they just keep turning around in circles and going, oh, maybe, maybe it'll be... Maybe it'll be Austin, Texas. You know, maybe it'll be like a project. I just don't know what I want to do, but then I'm going to start it. You know, and they just do that forever. And other people just put their head down and start swimming mindlessly in any direction and then realize that they've gone so far off course from where they thought they wanted to go that they, they've killed the passion for their music, right? They've, yeah. start, they've, got, they've gotten super good and super well-connected in a thing they don't even want to be doing, right? And sometimes maybe that's, by accident, sometimes it's by necessity because you need money and you have too much debt from Berkeley. <laughs> and sometimes it's just by accident because, again, people aren't taking a second to, to kind of assess their life and think, sure, I want to do music, but did I want to do this? Like, would I be happier actually with a day job playing music for fun as opposed to playing music I don't like and being too tired to make music I do like? Unbelievable, man. I mean, okay. I was honestly sitting there for a second just taking notes because what you were saying is gold, man. Like, um, I read, <laughs> I read this article by, um, not a musician, uh, a very famous journalist back in the days, uh, called Hunter Thompson. And he essentially described a very similar metaphor to what you were describing. And I'm curious your thoughts on this specific metaphor. He described the exact same thing in terms of being in an ocean. Um, and then he was basically going further, or not further, he was basically describing the same process. Is it better to swim or to tread water? Because a lot of people, myself included, and I know a lot of musicians, have that question of what do I do? I mean, music, yes, music is the theme of what we all want to do. But within music, there's literally thousands of things that you can do with music, like you were describing. You can be the session guy. You can be the songwriter guy. You can be the producer, arranger. Insert career thing here, right? There's a million things that you could put your energy into. But is it worth it to swim towards that direction if 
that's something that you end up not wanting to do. And will you ever figure out what you're going to do if you never actually swim? That's the curi- that's the curious question right there that a lot of people have a hard time deciding is when to actually start swimming, metaphorically speaking, when you don't see anything, when you haven't right. necessarily I- seen a distant object, yeah. is it best just to tread water for the time being? So what I, I think what's needed in that case is the phase of aggressive doing, right? So, yeah, you, you know, let's pretend you're swimming, you, you're swimming toward warmer waters, <laughs> you know, you're getting warmer, you're getting colder. You have to start moving in some direction to, to gauge whether or not it's getting warmer or colder. And <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think that's, that's a piece of it, but I don't know. I think it, I think you have to, start moving somewhere yeah. in order to, to get some idea of where you want to go. Cause I, I don't see, I mean, there's a, I, I spend a lot of time scheming. I kind of joke with a couple of my friends and my girlfriend that a lot of my time is spent like scheming master plans for world domination, but it, <laughs> it's kind of true. Like, but I think that's actually something that, uh, that has helped me that could help a lot of other people is the sitting and the thinking and the reanalyzing and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. Treading water momentarily is obviously beneficial because I'm advocating it too. Um, you just have to be careful that you don't get stuck doing it forever. You know? Yeah. And you know what's interesting is is um and I love this subject that we're talking about. I, I'm very passionate about it. I'm not sure if you can tell, but I think it's something that drives a lot of people, yeah. especially in our day and age. And this is one of my my personal opinions towards where we are now, specifically mm-hmm. in this age. I think we're in a very good age where a lot of opportunities are possible, very much because of the internet and just what we have available. You know what our parents couldn't do, we can do. You know, as um as young people or whatever, right? Um, but I also think a lot of the times because of how successful entrepreneurs or, or people like yourself are getting, and the internet basically makes that more accessible to people and they can see how successful you are, a lot of people can get very stressed out very quickly and put a lot of high expectations on themselves. Like, well, hey, if they're doing all this stuff, I got to like, you know, start hustling. I got to start selling stuff. I got to start getting into Bitcoin and then doing all this bunch of stuff. Uh, And you're laughing, but it's true because I get these questions too. I get a lot of people that are concerned and my, and my response to a lot of them are like, well, hang on a second. Like, are you trying to start a company? Are you trying to start a business or are you just trying to play music? Like, what is it? And then the answer more often than not is like, well, well, I don't know. And that's where I think what you were describing is key is that self-assessment, self-awareness. And, and I love entrepreneurs. Okay. A lot of the people that listen to this, I understand that I got a lot of my inspiration and a lot of uh, knowledge from entrepreneurs, specifically like Gary Vee, you know, Tim Ferriss, all those people. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that a lot of the people tend to miss from a lot of their lectures or, or all of the times that they give advice, the one thing that a lot of these successful people, even even not necessarily entrepreneurs, what they say is self-awareness. You got to be self-aware of who you are, what it is that you want to do, because you could end up being multi-Grammy winning producer dude, but you might end up hating producing like you were describing. And, and that reality is, I think, understanding what makes you tick and being willing to make choices, but at the same time, listening to how you react to those choices is very important. Big time. And what I would stack on that is, and this is, I mean, yeah, I've, I've read Tim Ferriss and, and plucked some ideas from his way of thinking. Um, but you can't, yeah, it was one of those things where you can't wholesale just be Tim Ferriss because again, yeah, for Tim Ferriss, right? So this is, again, it, it, it requires some critical thinking of what parts of this inspirational person actually apply to take right yeah because there are nuggets of wisdom from everyone even if it's don't do that um that's still you know as valid as a do do that exactly Um, but one thing i'd i'd advise people is to learn how the average working musician makes a living and how they got to where they are because a lot of people and in the entrepreneur world i think i would advise the same thing and this sounds like I'm saying settle for less, but <laughs> it it doesn't because in the music world, like with the drum off, like I would never coach someone on winning the drum off because it's a sure failure. It's literally a hundred percent failure <laughs> rate. So 
<laughs> it's 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 like if if you're like the story that you idolize is that of someone who who acquired extraordinary luck, especially if it's not at a time different than ours, right? Even ten years ago, how useful is that story really to you? Besides, as like a wouldn't it be cool if someone gave me a record deal, right? Sure, yeah. but that's not useful. That's not going to inform your actions. So, it's what I think is. Really, and even my story is a very small version of that, right? Because people are like, "Oh, JP, like, how do I do what you do?" And I'm like, "You're you can't do what I do because I won the drama. Like, I have this extraordinarily lucky lottery ticket that I got, and that's what I built my whole educational world on. So you can't do that. That's why whenever people ask me that, I tell them about my friends because I have a whole lot of successful musician friends who have, like I said before, have gotten big and small breaks." But didn't get you know the lottery ticket that they helped build everything on. So yeah, those are the types of people that it it you, that that everyone needs to find and go talk to. And what's sort of ironic and very convenient is that those people are just down the way, like they're just downtown playing clubs, doing sick stuff, right? Or yeah. they're passing through on tour, and they'd probably love to talk to you about it, right? Hey, can I buy you a coffee and interview you? It's like. People who do interviews all the time might hate interviews, but other people love to share their thoughts and their story. Yeah. So I used to do this YouTube series, and I keep telling myself that I need to do it again, and other people telling me the same, but it was the Working Musician interview series, where I would just interview my friends and be like, so you're kind of killing it, but no one knows who you are, and might, no one might ever know who you are, but people need to strive to be you, right? Not yeah. Katy Perry and Bruno Mars, and Diplo, right? Sure. If you if you're striving to just to make good art and do it as well as you can, and you you're starting to understand how people have done it, so you're you're learning some tricks. You might accidentally become Skrillex. There's no doubt. You might have the stroke of inspiration. You might have the big break. But again, you can't build your career around trying to become a superstar that requires a massive amount of luck. So that's a little piece of advice to people: is find successful musicians that you respect whose careers you would be thrilled to have and figure out what they did how they got there and then you'll find a lot of people that didn't go to berkeley a lot of people that didn't win a grammy right it's like yeah you know 99 percent of people who make a living playing music didn't go to a music school i would venture you know they're just out there doing music so find them and ask them what they do and then you'll yeah. find recurring themes in those answers. And it's a lot of, oh, I worked harder than everyone else. Oh, I moved to the city that I wanted to be in because it had the scene that I wanted to be in. Oh, I was outgoing. I learned more than everyone else did. It's like you'll hear a lot of the same things, but there's always something unique. You know, I reached out to this person unexpectedly. Even my friend the other day, she, she's, just, she's a foodie. And she's really into food. And she wants to start working in food. But she never has. And she's straight up applied at the, at the highest rated restaurant in the world, which is in New York City. And if I'm, if I'm misspeaking, then it's the highest rated in New York City, which is a big deal. Or a huge deal. I mean, come on. <laughs> she just applied to that. And the guy wrote her back. Like The owner was like, so you have no experience working in restaurants and you're applying for this restaurant. I like, your, I like your, <laughs> you know, what you're doing here. <laughs> and whether or not she gets a job, I mean, how much time did that take her to write an email? Max 30 minutes. And she could, let's pretend she did. You know, she got a, a foot in the door being an intern or, or a bus boy or whatever. Um, you know, it's just like those kinds of things. It, it just can't hurt, right? So it's like yeah. just, yeah, just doing everything you can, reaching out to whoever you can and trying to just take little steps. I think the overall theme that I'm getting from you, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh -huh. and again, I love this, uh, because of what it speaks so true to what's helped me in my life and what's helped a lot of other people too, is that 
you essentially strive or in the past and still to this day, you have strived to be the best person you could be. And along the way you had goals, there were certain opportunities that came up, um, you know, whether it's the competition or not, whether it was a band or not, um, you didn't necessarily focus on it as I had to get this competition or I had to do this. You essentially always found a way to bring back to you and ensure that you were being the best version of you that you could possibly be given your resources, given what you could do. That's the, that's the key to your success. In my opinion, based on what I'm hearing of your history and your background, you just always, that, that was your, your passion. You wanted to be the best version that you could be. And when you were describing with like Skrillex and, and, and Katy Perry, Personally, I don't think it's it's necessarily a bad thing to want to be like a superstar. I think a lot of us always have wanted at some point to be, you know, a superstar of something. But I think what you also say that speaks truth is that just wishing, just wanting to be like Katy Perry, well, you can't. You, you, I mean, there's only one Katy Perry. But if you strive to be the best version of you that you could be, you very much could end up being your own version of that superstar. But it's going to have to be your own version. And yeah. that's the way to get it is by focusing, uh, by focusing on being the best version of you. Yeah, and superstardom, I, I tend to think, for the most part, comes from luck. Yeah. And successful musicianhood. So being able to tell people, what do you do for a living? I'm a professional musician. And not feeling like you need to add any like cr- discredits in there. That's the goal. Right. And that's ex- yeah. the, funny, the funny thing is, that's extraordinarily difficult to do yeah. right, in any art field to just be comfortable doing your art. So that's a super difficult thing to do. And you should try to do that. And then you might accidentally just become Bruno Mars. <laughs> <laughs> Accidentally. I mean, really in reality, I mean, what are the odds? It's always accidental. But I think yeah. when you're comfortable, when you figure out that secret of how to be comfortable with your, um, with your art, like what you were saying, it's, that's what you find the true genius, in my opinion, is when you are not doing it for anyone else, when you're just creating for your own sake and improving for your own sake, that's where you get that. That's where normally a lot of the people get that stroke of inspiration is in that mindset. Yeah. It makes sense because when you, if you're thinking I need to be the superstar, there's a lot of pressure on everything you do. If you're thinking like I need to be happy playing music and make enough money to, you know, X, have a family or not or travel or whatever it is or just exist, then it's a way less pressure situation. And the coincidence that's the happy coincidence is that when you have less pressure, most people, not everyone, perform better. They have better ideas because they just are doing it for fun. And that's how they're, that's how they learn to have good ideas. We learn to have good ideas by having fun doing our instrument. And then all of a sudden when we add a bunch of pressure, we're confused why we're not having good ideas anymore. Yeah. It's so true. I mean, having those unrealistic expectations all of a sudden, and maybe not even unrealistic expectations, but just the expectations itself, in my opinion, get rid of creativity overall, because being creative requires freedom to some sort of degree. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. I I love talking to you, man. I love everything that you're bringing because you were a very wise dude. All the rumors I heard about Mr. Bouvet are absolutely true. (laughs) I think you you bring a very refreshing take on what it takes to be a musician, a creative, just someone that's that's, you know, in tune with who they are. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious. I wanted to ask about this a little bit earlier and I just wanted to circle back. Um, we've talked a lot about you know, what we do and, and what we like to do and how to be the best version of us that we can, that we can be a big part of your life, which we talked about earlier was the big like doing part or, um, where you're figuring out a lot of what you were trying to do was Berkeley. Um, but from what I hear, and obviously you could, you could correct me if I'm wrong. I do hear that Berkeley has a, a high dropout rate from students, mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaking. Right. Um, I'm curious if you feel like and, and obviously we we talked about this before for you going to Berkeley at the time was the right choice um do you feel like Berkeley was absolutely necessary to your educational career or would you have still obviously you would have ended up somewhere different we can agree on that but would you have still ended up somewhere similar without that education that you know the most prestigious music school provides yeah yeah and so again and everyone's different and not by all means 
do not think everyone needs to go to Berkeley. But I think if I hadn't gone to Berkeley, I wouldn't be doing music for a career. Yeah. Uh, that's partially because I was considering other careers when I was thinking about college. Um, I was thinking about uh, architecture and graphic design. But, oh, no way. You're a graphic designer too. Damn. Well, hardly. But <laughs> I, I can at least work Photoshop well enough to make posters and make things look pretty. But <laughs> nice. um, So so this is the sort of this is the catch 22 with music school is that ask anyone who's gone to any art school and they will tell you that really the main thing they they needed from the school was a network and you look at my career and my life would have panned out extremely differently had i not gone to berkeley it's kind of impossible to imagine because at this point I live in New York City because I was in Boston and New York City is really close and I need to be close to my friends so I can go back and forth and play music with them. Yeah. And all the friends I have now, almost, I met in Boston. All the bands I've played and all the experience I've gained was contacts from Boston. The Generation X gig with Steve Vai, even that is sort of indirectly through my Berkeley connections because it was Matt Garska who originally had the gig and recommended me and he only knew me because we lived across the hall from each other. Oh, no way. That's crazy. Right. And, and countless other things have happened in my life. Like the educational side of my life is rather irrelevant, actually, from Berkeley. Right. That stemmed from the drum off. But so so that's my story. But the important thing in the story, again, isn't Berkeley. It's like I said earlier, putting yourself in the best place to succeed. So whatever that is for you. Right. If, if you're asked to pay sixty thousand dollars a year. You should not be attending Berkeley for four years. If you can afford two years, go for two years. If you can afford one, go for one. If you can afford four, maybe still just go for one, right? Because you know that the network is the most important thing. And once you've started a network, you can just hang out around the school and you mooch off people's resources and <laughs> get to know people and not be you know, weighed down with that when you're done. But if it's not Berkeley, it's maybe it's another school. If it's not another school, maybe it's another city. Right. And it doesn't have to be. It shouldn't be. The option should not just be New York, Nashville and L.A. Because there are a lot of awesome sort of second uh, second tier. And I mean, only in size, second tier size cities in this country and in Europe where there's a lot of amazing stuff happening. And it'll actually be easier to get a foothold and, and build a career because it's not so ridiculously competitive. Yeah. So right every day, I don't I mean, probably a thousand musicians move, move to New York City, and that's your competition. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a little crazy, but that's um that's kind of how I like to think about like you positioning yourself best is again how far can you reach or you put yourself to to have the best chances of succeeding. Yeah. Cause, yeah, because for me, Berkeley was was everything. But had I been somewhere else, that place would have been everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. The place is kind of interchangeable, but you should go into it knowing that the network is what you're going to need. And you're going to need to be good at what you do to a certain level. So, yeah. I love that answer, man. I mean, I where did you get so wise, man? How did you get all this wisdom? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you I haven't been alive for that long, man. Maybe I've just done enough clinics that people ask me hard questions and I have to actually think about them. And I'm like, I don't want to let people down. So I'm like, damn, I don't, I don't know. So I, I guess the, I've given enough bad answers to sometimes give good answers. So <laughs> there's a wake of skeletons in my past of people I've told to do terrible things. <laughs> <laughs> I find that hard to believe. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm curious, like, do you ever, and maybe this is getting a little bit too, a little bit too far. Obviously, we all face haters from time to time. Obviously, mm -hmm. I think that's just part of uh, anyone's life. You're going to have a group of people that just are, are, nev are never going to like what you do. Um, are there any people out there that ever like, you know, make it, make it their point to try and get to you and just be like, Hey, the only reason why you're JP Bouvet is because of this competition. And has that ever gotten to you? And, and obviously I don't think it has based on my conversation, um, with, with what you've been saying this whole entire conversation, you are very well composed and incredibly wise, but I know with a lot of younger musicians coming up and some of them that ask me, some that have some potential and then potentially getting their name out there, this does 
happen a lot. You know, there are definitely a lot of people out there that are, just, that are always just going to hate what you do, whether it is through your competition or through, you know, you played with that band or you got this, uh, I don't know, producer connection, whatever. Whatever the excuse is, there's always going to be a lot of people out there that are going to hate on what you do. And sometimes that causes doubt. That does cause doubt in certain people. And I'm curious, obviously, you know how to deal with that. How is it that you deal with that and, and move forward understanding that you put in the work, you know exactly what you did um, and yeah. move on? If that makes sense. Yeah, well, there's not any person I'm aware of that's like sending me hate mail on a daily Good. basis. But um, <laughs> but it's here and there. It's interesting because I would actually, I would say the, the more, because I don't, mind you, I, I don't spend any time on YouTube, period. But I especially don't spend any time reading people's comments. Although when I do glance at them, usually like a day after I'll post something to to actually respond to people who've, you know, obviously been the most excited to see it, is for whatever reason, my my community of, of fans has been extraordinarily kind. And I think they appreciate, I've always made some kind of an accidental effort in the beginning and then more of a concerted effort later to be real with people and, and be myself. So I think when you are being yourself, like my fan base appreciates that I'm, I'm, you know, showing myself warts and all. And for that, I I think people are less inclined to think of you as just some, you know, robot behind a screen. Like I'm I'm a dude, you know, that, that they feel that they know. And rightly so because a lot of them, if they've watched all the blogs, they, they should feel like they know me. I mean, they've seen me evolve in those videos for the last eight years it's a long time. When I look, it's a very long time. Painful to look back at those old videos because I'm so young and stupid, and I look <laughs> like an idiot in the mohawk, and I'm just like, oh, but I should leave them because it's like if people want to know me, then they can know me, and you just have to have faith that they'll they'll follow you up to this point. But what's funny is I'm to and to be to be really honest with all your listeners, I I do struggle. I have a bit of imposter syndrome where I do struggle with um, feeling worth in, in certain circles mm. um, because I know my strengths and I know my weaknesses. And teaching someone, doing a clinic, I feel really confident in doing that. There are other musical scenarios that I feel like, not ashamed, but I feel like I should be much better equipped to do those things. Like why, and, if I can ask? Well, like certain musical styles or sitting in at certain gigs or no, like having a Rolodex of, of, of songs in my head that I know the, the parts to, right? I don't have that. Yeah. And I know people who excel in that. And it's easy to see people have their specialty be your weakness and be like, it just highlights that kind of thing. So in this, you know, in the last, since the drum off, I've been, I've like subtly obsessed for many years with trying to get people to forget that it happened by building what I considered real credentials. And that's not a slam to the drum off. But again, the drum off is a very lucky thing. Yeah. And it's it's a drum off. It's not a music off. No one in the actual music world knows about knows that it even exists. Yeah. So this is this is a weird like sort of mind explosion for some people when when they realize I'm not a well-known drummer in New York City because to them I'm a famous drummer but I'm a famous I'm much more famous drummer in the drum community than I am in the music industry right so I've been pushing to rebalance that for you know I, I mean I kind of still am right now since I launched my own band Childish Japes it's it's a much more balanced sort of happy medium because I like both. I like doing both things. Um, but it is it, it more than most people realize those things don't overlap at all. Um, so that's so, so there's that aspect of it. The other aspect of it is I don't get hate from people who are like, JP, you're an idiot and you suck like piss off like no one <laughs> no one wastes their time doing that um but it's interesting because and and i think a lot of people will sympathize with with this the in the the um the there's like invisible haters right you've got your own internal hater 
which is constantly judging yourself and the things that you're trying to do. And then you've got invisible haters, which is the not the no call, right? No one is calling you for a gig. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that kind of says a lot about the situation, right? So that what does that mean? It means something. It means you're either not that great or you're not that well connected. You haven't put your time in or you haven't you haven't done the right gigs or you haven't gotten lucky or any series of, of variables. But the the invisible hater no call is as much sort of a taunting thing as people calling you and telling you you're an idiot. So for me, when I moved to New York, I had always been in this tight knit circle of, of people in Boston that I played music with in bands. Yeah. And then we moved, everyone sort of, well, everyone moved somewhere, but many of them ended up in New York. And then over the next couple of years, everyone kind of ended their projects. Like the bands I was in just sort of disappeared all of a sudden. And I was never a part of the scene in New York City. Part of that was that I was gone a third of the year and, and to, to be the guy that's like, you know, building up your, your cred in a new city, you got to be around and you got to be taking gigs. You got to be aggressive doing. Yeah. And I, I was not doing that and I didn't really want to do that and I couldn't have done it if I wanted to. So the no call was taunting me as these gigs ended because I, I was like, well, what am I going to do? Right. Yeah. At the same time, I was at the same time. This was a couple of years ago, a few years ago now. But I was rather unhappy because I was just not enjoying so much what I was doing. It was so imbalanced that I was playing the drums, doing things that I didn't want to do more than the things that I did want to do. And what I realized is the thing I actually wanted to do didn't exist at all. I just needed a creative outlet for my drumming. Like that was basically the long and short of it. Um, so that was when the idea started happening to form Childish Japes, to create a band of my own. That was just, no, and that's why Childish Japes is specifically purposed to have no boundaries and to just, we'll put out a jazz album and a rock album next and then whatever we want after that. So the whole reason that exists is because I needed something that was just a creative outlet. Um, and that, and now, so, so now I have these, this sort of trifecta of my, my career, which is the educational stuff, my website, clinics, this, uh, anything like, you know, like that. Yeah. Um, Childish Japes, which is my, my passion project, my, my, my personal voice where people can ask, what do you do on the drums? And I can point to a band and say that that's what I do. Um, and then hired gun stuff. So right now, you know, I play for Generation X. I've subbed for Matt in Periphery. Um, random stuff. Do occasional but not frequent sessions and gigs around New York, usually through people that are in my network, bands that drummer just dropped out or whatever. Um, so stuff like that. So those are kind of the three areas of my drumming life. And they kind of ebb and flow each on their own, right? Yeah. So and that rebalancing is always exciting. Like something new comes up and all of a sudden, the, the the session guy is is taking you know the majority of my energy and then that ends and childish japes takes the majority of my energy i go on a clinic tour and it switches to education mode so that for me is is how it works and that was all a result of me not getting calls like there, i don't know there's a lesson in here somewhere of like okay i'm trying to follow the rule book right and I only yeah. kind of was because admittedly I wasn't too thrilled about, I wasn't trying to be the guy in New York city. Um, but I think I wasn't trying because I knew that I wasn't destined to be it. I wasn't, I'm not cut out to be that guy. I don't want to be that guy now. And if I did then, I think I was naive. Um, so in lieu of the ordinary thing working, I had to improvise and make some things work. Right. So all my clinic tours, I book. That's one thing that a lot of people don't realize. They're like, man, I wish I could get indoors so they book me clinic tours. It's like, no, they, these companies have way better things to do than just... <laughs> than just book your, your clinic tours. Right? So it was... These have all been me, and it's still to this day. I mean, I could, the thing is, it's finally... I'm at a point, I think, where I actually could ask my companies to, to, to book me something. <laughs> but 
it becomes so, I don't know. I just like to be in charge. I like to design the, how it's going on. I like to spend extra time places that I like. Yeah. And I don't really, there are certain places I want to go and certain places I don't. And like I'm booking, I booked a trip in South Africa this year, a place I've really nice. wanted to go as I've read more about the history of Nelson Mandela and followed the the political turnover there recently. So it's like, that's a place I would just love to be. So a guy, I did, like a, an opportunity presented itself. And I was like, oh, yeah. I mean, I would love to do an interview for your South Africa magazine, but like, I would also love to come to South Africa. And he was like, oh, what a coincidence. I'm launching a drum festival and we could b- book a bunch of clinics and camps. So that's where it kind of spawned from. Um, but that's a part of, of my a big part of the success I'm going to put that in quotes quote success that (laughs) is is in response to not getting any breakthroughs you know what I mean like I, I can list very few lucky breaks I could list Gen X the periphery thing uh the drum off and maybe a couple other things but other than that a couple of handouts, it's been a lot of like me doing what I wish someone would invite me to do. So, yeah. and of course this isn't the lesson there is, is not do what I'm doing. Again, I, I can do clinics because I have a following because I want the drum up and built a fan base. The, the lesson is, it is not do what I'm doing. It's do find a way to do what you're doing, whether it's mainstream or not, you know, whether you're getting the call, like if you, if you're getting the call, great. If you're not, don't just sit around, you know, do something. Yeah. So there's that. And then there's this other small idea that I'll share that's, like I mentioned, the, and this is, again, this plays into how I've uh, built, especially the educational part of my career. Um, and it's, it's making the most of opportunities, which seems really simple. I wanted to use the word <laughs> opportunist, but then I actually looked that up. And it actually is like the negative part of it. Yeah, it but, really is. <laughs> it, it's, it's more about taking advantage. Yeah, it's when you leave your principles behind and exploit short-term gains. So don't do that. Um, <laughs> but, but when an opportunity arises, how do you maximize uh, pro- profit? I mean, you can say not, not financial, but your own profit from it. Um, and the South Africa thing is a perfect example. I still do this all the time and I'm, I consciously think of it now. I think I was doing it by accident before or out of fear, um, out of necessity. But now guy calls me, guy hits me up from South Africa. And he's like, you want to do an interview? I'm like, okay, we're about to make a big deal out of this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now I'm going to be down there for three and a half weeks. Um, like spending as much time, hopefully just like meeting people and learning about the culture as I am you know, teaching drums. So I can do that because it's on my watch and it's my design that I can spend a whole week and a half exploring a country. <clears throat> um, and that's, I've been doing that since, since literally the first opportunity I was given after the drum off, which was Meinl offered to, or invited me to come to their, do their drum festival in Germany. Yeah, that's right. They would fly me out to Germany. Which you performed like, hey. great, by the way. It was a great performance. Oh, thanks. I'm hoping they invite me back so I can do one that's much better. But <laughs> um, so I got, I was like, oh, well, cool. First international trip. So can you book my flight, return flight back, you know, two weeks or whatever. And then I didn't, I didn't do anything productive because I had no following to <laughs> that would attend a clinic. Um, but I did rent a car and drive around Italy and Austria and Switzerland for a little bit and see the people I did know out there and um, just made a trip of it. And that was the beginning of this idea of like, wow, when, when someone invites me to do something or when someone says, hey, or would you be interested in this gig? Like, how do I maximize its potential? And that's all. There's nothing bad about it. It doesn't involve manipulating anyone. It just involves looking at what you could do with the resources you're given and do in choosing how much of it you want to do. That's again, I, I was literally just sitting there just like writing notes because every, everything you're saying, it's just gold, absolutely gold for anyone trying to, to do anything, myself included. I mean, I think we're always faced with all, all these opportunities and, and, and trying to figure out how to maximize 
uh, that opportunity is an art form in itself, if, if I can be honest. Um, you know what I'm curious about? And maybe maybe you'll disagree with me, but do you feel like that moment where you weren't getting like, you know, when you realized that you weren't the guy that people were trying to call, um, it, it could have been for a lot of musicians, it could be a very not depressing. I don't want to say depressing, but just very eye opening moment where you're basically you know, face to sort of see the situation that you're in. Do you feel like that was a moment going back to what we were talking about earlier that you sort of had to swim a different direction and maybe you were swimming in another direction and you had to sort of tread water for a little bit and yes, be like, or swim more confidently in the direction you're going um, without, without any help from jet stream. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And I love it because everything we talk about, really, what I'm getting from you is that you have basically always understood at some level, you've understood what you needed to do. And you've always gone after that, you know, and I think as we as we get older, all of us, you know, wisdom sort of accumulates and we tend we tend to be a little bit more self-aware as to what we want to do. But if there's any, I mean, I've learned so much from you, man. I mean, you've been very self-aware. You basically go after what you want to do. You maximize your opportunities and then you just you don't necessarily put in any, any massive expectations on yourself you just basically strive to be the best version of you that you can be and by default you get all the success out of it and i honestly am just feeling super inspired after talking with you man that's awesome yeah and and to add on to that last response about um you know does it you know swimming in, in even harder or changing direction when you get some kind of negative feedback from the world is Negative feedback is, especially today, rare, right? No one wants to shake the boat. They do on, <laughs> they do, they do on YouTube, but that, that doesn't count. That's not real feedback. That's yeah. feedback. So when life gives you a rare moment of honest feedback, whether it's someone sitting you down and saying, hey, you actually kind of suck at this, or, you know, the, not, the no call, um, it's – it's important to like, again, to kind of circle back to where we started to be analytical of yourself and not be afraid to, to be self-critical and, and to, to, be, to be real about what your strengths and weaknesses are. Um, I used to be naively, um, what's the word, uh, unrealistic thinking about my own skills. And one thing I've gotten better at is actually knowing what, like, how good I am at things. I used to really think I could do anything. And in a way, it's not healthy to think that way. Because yeah. you, can't, you can't strategize and pick your battles and, and play to your strengths if you actually think everything is your strength. So I think it's because I started to get a little older and, and know people who were actually good at things that I thought I was good at. And that, that goes for everything from public speaking to drumming to thinking to composing to remembering facts like it, <laughs> it's, you you have to it it took me too long in life to be able to really be humbled by someone when i would see people do things i would think i can do that and i was wrong but i had no idea and now i'm much more likely to realize my boundaries and think and see people for the brilliant thing that they are, instead of trying to <laughs> mentally imagine myself one-upping them. You know what I mean? <laughs> that, that's a huge benefit when you're trying to work in networks and teams, which is all we do. So if, you know, I need to realize what my bandmates' strengths are, like where what they're better at than me, so that we can delegate work and I can appreciate what they do and it can be good. Because the end product is what I care about. Not the, I don't care about like me having the good idea. I just care about one of us having the good idea. And yeah. three of us recognizing the idea as the good idea. And then rolling with it and trying to get our egos out of the way. And that's been – the because I've worked alone a lot, right? So I built my website. That Everything I do education-wise is alone. I run a business by myself, basically. Um, and the band, Childish Japes, is – we're a team. And I'm sort of the band manager, but only administratively. And when we are doing anything creative, whether it's writing music or planning a music video, um, it's extremely collaborative. And it's been super educational for me because I trust these guys and I respect 
their opinion in, in certain, especially in, in certain cases, I respect their opinion more than mine. I'm like, okay, this is Asher's specialty. And even though and it's funny, cause I'm starting to learn, like, I'll be like thinking my idea is a good idea. And Asher will be like adamant about like, no, like, this that's a terrible idea actually and then like a month later i'll look back and be like thank god we didn't do my idea that was a terrible idea <laughs> <laughs> and just starting to 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 really trust people work-wise more deeply than perhaps i've had to before and maybe it's only apparent now because it's something i care about so much you know, this music is <clears throat> really our thing so but yeah that's been uh, a really and it makes me it makes you so much happier to not think that you could outdo everyone around you. What an important lesson to learn, man. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. As I mean, I suffer I suffer from that stuff still to this day, but you're right. As we get older, we to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah, especially if you're good at something. You know, as musicians, we're we're good at this one thing that we love. And so I think it's natural to sort of try and 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 make yourself believe that you can achieve almost anything. Right. Um but you're right. I think a lot of the successful uh, successful people, especially the ones that I've encountered, the ones that I've worked with very closely, they're very good at understanding what they're good at. And they're very good at outsourcing or at least being able to sort of create a team around them where they can sort of supplement what they're not good at. And there's no shame in admitting that. In fact, I feel like that's how you become a, a stronger individual is being being wise enough to see, okay, here's exactly what I'm going to excel at. Um, and here's what, you know, person B can excel at. And so I can either try and do every single part and then end up being stressing myself out and not coming out with that great of a product. Or I can sort of, you know, do what I do best, let person B do what they do best. And then we come out with the best product possible, whether that's yeah. a, an album, a band, a song, you know, you get the point, I think. Yeah. I think there's, there's some, uh, I think it's a prayer coming to mind that was that we could change if it is what is it it's a <clears throat> grant me the the strength to change the things i can the something to to uh, i know i know what you're talking about one, and the wisdom to know the difference and that's the part that we're sort of applying here is like you know you need the smarts you, you need the the awareness to know um, when you need to push and when you need to let go a little bit and let go of an idea. And the, the tricky part is the wisdom to know when it's okay to do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it comes with experience though. I honestly believe that if you're willing to learn Absolutely. from life and your experiences and lessons that come along, I think it, it, it we all end up developing our own version of, of wisdom and awareness of that. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, you know, just trying trying to learn. You can't not learn if you're trying to learn. <laughs> Absolutely. And and you cannot get better if you're not trying to be the best person that you can be. You know what I mean? Yeah. JP, honestly, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. I had no idea what we were going to talk about today. I had a a vision in mind, but I am so glad that I I that we talked because I myself feel incredibly inspired. And this is the reason why I do this is, I mean, by default, I have, you know, just a group of people that happen to like listening to the guests that I bring on board. But I, and I do this to remind, you know, a lot of the, the listeners is that I really do this a lot for me because I love to learn and I feel inspired every time that I bring someone on here that's doing something cool. And JP, you're no different from that, man. You're, in fact, you're one of the most, one of the wisest individuals I've had on here in a while. And, and I'm just grateful that you've gotten a chance, that you basically just let me inside your life just for a little bit and let me know like how it is that you do your, your thing. And I can't wait to apply some of the lessons that you've taught me here today into what I'm doing, man, because I, I feel like I can do so much more now, now that I've talked to you. Yeah, that's really awesome. Thank you very much for the super kind words and for doing this podcast, man. That's, a, that's something I... I admire about people is is actually podcasters that's that's one awesome way to make a difference in the world and spread information that you think is valuable to the world so you are a fantastic interviewer actually this was really fun so i really oh, appreciate wow. it compliments from mr jp bouvet i feel incredibly <laughs> i feel i feel very honored my friend and even though we've already said everything we possibly could ever ever said just as a quick little recap Obviously, if there's going to be someone listening to this episode and very anxious to, to hear from you, just as a recap, um, what can someone do today 
um, in order for them to sort of take the next step into their career. Um, whether it is planning, whether it is, you know, figuring out what they are, what would you summarize and advise for them to be focusing on today or tomorrow, something that could potentially help them start moving forward with what they want to do in music? Mm, okay. I think two things. One, identify what it is you love about music or whatever you do. <clears throat> And remember that, like take a mental note in Sharpie, because that's what your decisions should should center around. And this can be very vague, right? Um, I love being creative, or I love I love not being creative. I love I love playing cover songs, right? Whatever it is that yeah that you just like get off on playing the drums, <clears throat> make a mental note because that should inform your decisions. And the next thing is just, I think, to remember that everything's a bigger deal in your mind than it is when you actually do it. Yeah. And I hope everyone has experienced this at some point. Um, and it's just that feeling of you hyping yourself up so badly. And then you finally do something. And it was like, oh, that was kind of easy. Right. And it's like, <laughs> why was I stressing all that time? Right? If, you think of it, if you think about it, it's really insane it, it makes sense why we do it but at the same time it's like <clears throat> you'll spend a month stressing about something and it'll go fine and that's what's so crazy like it'll go fine and you're like hmm that went fine and i just wasted a massive amount of energy and life on I'm stressing out currently nothing because had yeah. i not stressed i still would have done the work right so it's like you can you can do the work stressed or you can do the work enjoying the fact that you're doing work that you enjoy so, yeah, it's not that big a deal. And if you're thinking about, you know, what what's the next step? What is the thing I need to do? Who's the person I need to talk to? I've been meaning to go to that club and sit in on the jam. I've been meaning to do this, but it's a big deal. Just go fucking do it. And then you'll realize, oh, that wasn't that bad. And eventually you'll get really good at knowing that it's not going to be that bad. <laughs> I've been nervous for enough things and they've worked out. You know, you know, uh, some of them incredibly and some of them barely scraping by, but they've all I've survived and I'm here and I'm extremely happy and I, in this moment. So clearly they weren't that big a deal because I didn't die and I'm not super depressed. So <laughs> I can now remind myself when something nerve wracking comes up <clears throat> or something that's scary that I've felt that thousands of times and it's going to be all right. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with JP. I am just blown away. I'm, I'm still sitting here writing my notes and really taking in everything that I learned from JP. And I say this at the end of every episode. I'm always learning from everyone that comes through this show. I think it's important to always have an open mind and understand what it is that you want to do where it is that you want to go in your career and learn techniques, learn skills, learn applications that help you improve your chances. After JP's talk, I really just am blown away by all of the metaphors that he gave and the really good explanations he gave on how to really pursue your career. And look, maybe you're not trying to be a musician. Maybe you're not trying to be the world's best drummer or maybe you're not. Maybe you're just interested in pursuing something random in the music industry or you're still finding your way. You're still trying to find what it is that you're passionate about, how many resources you have at your disposal. But the reality is we're all on that same boat at some point in our life. We're all going to be floating in the ocean trying to figure out where to swim. And the idea is to always be swimming and to always try and go a direction and to always really look deep inside yourself and figure out what it is that drives you, what it is that you want to do. Now, if you enjoyed this interview, please consider subscribing because I do this every week. I bring on amazing guests, amazing artists, amazing people that are just killing it in the music industry. And I talk to them about their process, how they got started, basically what keeps them motivated with the hopes that it can inspire you to continue being motivated and pushing your career forward in whichever direction that may be. That's my goal for you is for you to constantly be pushing your career forward. And as always, I have lots of great content coming your way.